My name is Eric Ruth Ford. I am a preemie dad and a writer. I'm uh, writing a book called Please Cry, A Father's View from Outside the Incubator. And I've also uh, done advocacy work, both with the hospital where Gabriel was born and with uh, the national uh, associations that set standards for preemie care. Um, about how uh, preemies should be cared for, and uh, spe specifically um, the questions of when to intervene and when not to intervene for extremely immature uh, infants who are uh, born um, born prematurely. So let's go. I'm going to start. Oh, good, it does go forward with a video here. Uh. Got him off the dopamine now. That's what Mary was saying. That, yes, and that means his heart is keeping his blood pressure up at the right level by itself. Okay. And uh, there's, um, his blood is a little on the acidic side, so okay. giving him sodium bicarbonate for that. Already he's getting baking soda, huh? Yeah. And he's been getting a lot of transfusions lately, um, just because, well, his body only has about three tablespoons of blood in it. Is that all? Yeah. Three tablespoons, wow. Yeah. It took quite a bit of work to get to this point um, for us. Um, he w Mary went into labor at 21 weeks and four days of gestation, and um, that was preterm labor. And she was offered um, a, a, an abortion at that time and a couple of times after that um, under the belief that it was unlikely that the pregnancy would be able to get to a point where the uh, baby could be saved. Um, before um, the doctor saved his life, he said, I don't recommend that babies should be treated at this point because the results are so poor. If you give birth after midnight, I'll be the one who comes and does the resuscitation, but my heart won't fully be in it. Uh, the hospital at that time had a rule of 23 weeks and zero days being the minimum of when a, uh, a preemie could be resuscitated. Um, and so at first he was saying he would not come, and later he, and then he also at the same time was recommending against um, uh, doing intervention. The birth occurred at 11.20 p.m., and he came and he did a fine job um, from there. It caused considerable stress for us, however, um, believing, you know, the Mary's water broke at 6.30 p.m. that day. It caused considerable stress for us was we didn't know if he was going to show up. Um, we didn't know what our course of care was going to be um, from that point. So in the days and months that followed uh, Gabriel's birth, something that nagged at us and we wondered about was, can he do that? Um, and uh, the, question, the answer, uh, as we d discovered, was that uh, yes, um, the doctor's recommendation was in line with national standards. Um, this uh, quotation I have up here is from the Neonatal Resuscitation Program Clinical Guidelines that's put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics. These are the guidelines from 2010. Uh, when gestation, birth weight, or congenital anomalies are associated with almost certain early death and when unacceptably high morbidity is likely among the rare survivals, resuscitation is not indicated. Examples include extreme prematurity, gestational age of less than 23 weeks, or birth weight of less than 400 grams. And it lists a number of other conditions that are um, justification for not uh, providing care. Um, so I should point out that Gabriel was 652 grams at birth, uh, quite a bit above this uh, minimum. Um, which il illustrates the uh, variability uh, within a particular um, age level of, uh, of preemies. Um, the, that weight of 652 grams put him into the 97th percentile um, w for size, which, if you can believe, they blamed on me. <laughs> So then came the question of why would he say that and why would the national uh, standards uh, say such a thing? And this, uh, these statistics here on the, on the chart are um, 
outcome statistics for um, preemies born in Japan at the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th week. And in the 22nd week, 63% um, of the uh, babies in this study uh, died before they could leave the NICU. 73% uh, died or had profound neurodevelopmental impairment um, uh, at the time or uh, when they were tested uh, later. Um, 20, in the 22nd week, 12% emerged with minimal or no impairment. Um, the, this is a study from Japan. Uh, and the reason I'm using the, the uh, statistics from Japan is because the rules in Japan have been since the 1990s to routinely um, resuscitate infants in the 22nd week of gestation. Um, here in the United States, it's, a more, it's been a more uh, haphazard uh, collection of rules um, and guidelines that doctors have followed, so there's not such a, uh, a, a large population of 22nd week preemies to study over here. Um, so um, what this shows is that it is by no means a, uh, a cakewalk uh, what we were asking for for our son. We were asking for uh, care to be given to a child who the, who the statistics said uh, was quite likely um, to die. Um, before he could leave the hospital. From the doctor's perspective, this uh, amounted to futility. And medical futility is defined as care unlikely to benefit the patient or treatment to provide poor quality of benefit. And in this context, uh, a profoundly um, impaired child would, um, in, in the uh, doctor's view, would have been a treatment to provide poor quality of uh, benefit. Within this understanding of futility, however, there is a something of a time crunch. The baby was just fine before birth. Um, Miri was quite adamant uh, that um, her, our baby was not having a problem. She was the one with the medical condition. The medical condition was preterm labor. In the womb, um, all indications appeared from ultrasound and from uh, other uh, or, uh, examinations that the, uh, our baby was doing just fine. So the futility was over problems uh, not yet experienced. However, um, you have to make a decision um, before the birth occurs because uh, when the birth occurs, uh, if you're going to do resuscitation, you have to do it immediately. And the doctor made it very clear that a resuscitation in this case went way beyond uh, standard uh, CPR. It involved a breathing tube down uh, the throat into the lungs. It involved all sorts of uncomfortable wires and uh, catheters. And, um, and it could involve doing uh, chest compressions on a... Uh, on a child with a heart that was about the size of a dime. So, um, and that was one thing a different doctor told us. Uh, so the one thing he really hated doing was chest compressions on a preemie because um, if the child's on the way out and you know the only the entirety of his life is uh, being pushed on in that awful way, you know that's not a very um, that, that's not a very good experience that the doctor has given the child. So how are you to view this, um, this moment uh, where things appear futile? Um, there is this thing that the that bioethicists will uh, talk about called a window of death. And that is a, a time in which um, you could take actions that would result in the uh, death of the patient. Um, so how do we view this, this, this moment? Um, in this country, 67% of Down syndrome uh, babies are aborted after uh, Down syndrome is detected in the womb. Uh, this is a, a statistic that upset us. Uh, and we also and made us wonder, is uh, this same kind of attitude towards the disabled uh, being applied to our child who is being born uh, extremely prematurely? So you could, is this, uh, is the intent of your actions to walk away from a potentially disabled child? Again, as, as I said, a negative attitude towards the disabled. We were afraid of that uh, coming against our child. Or, our, uh, which would be taking advantage of the disabled at their weaklet, weakest, or are you reducing the suffering of someone who is likely to die? We also needed to think about autonomy. 
Um, our child was autonomy, j autonomous, just barely, in the sense that he could survive outside of the womb with assistance. Um, when you're looking at the ethics of a, um, of a woman's pregnancy, in early pregnancy, the focus is on the mother's autonomy, and then in mid-pregnancy, the uh, change comes to balancing maternal, maternal fetal best interests in the ethical, medical ethical texts that I've found. Um, and so then who decides on behalf of a child, on, of the child? It becomes a negotiation between the doctor and the parents and an understanding of what the uh, best interests of that child are. And to give, uh, to take this uh, dilemma and put it into adult care, uh, consider these two examples. Um, if you have a breast cancer patient with a 30% chance of survival, um, but then the doctor says, uh, no, we're not going to provide care. It's futile. Um, you're just going to have to go home, and, and that's all the treatment I'll give you. Or, uh, conversely, if you were to tell adult patients that they have a fatal condition um, that could be treated with a 30% chance of survival, five months of treatment, it's very uncomfortable, and disability is very likely with survival, will they all say yes? I don't know if I would say yes to that um, set of um, condition or that set of predictions. And it is something that also um, concerns me, too, from the decision that we made about Gabriel, given we gave him five months of very uncomfortable care. We don't think he um, remembers any of that, um, but, um, you know, is that something that he uh, really, uh, did, did that do something to him that um, he would not have liked? And then, um, in this question of the best interests of the child, how low is too premature? Um, I was talking with a doctor on the, on the phone uh, a week ago, a neonatologist from Florida, um, who was telling me that he's had parents who at 20 weeks of gestation were begging for intervention, and at 28 weeks of, of gestation, were asking for no intervention to be uh, provided. And in both cases, he had to go against the parents' wishes. Um, one, because the chances at 28 weeks are somewhere up in the 90% range, and so the chances were so good that he felt he had an obligation to provide care there. And at 20 uh, weeks of gestation, the chances are so bad that he felt that there was, or the chances were almost no nothing, so he felt the treatment would uh, only uh, serve to uh, cause discomfort to the child. So eventually, as much as uh, this presentation, uh, much of it is about um, providing more uh, respect to the wishes of the parents. However, uh, I have to admit there is a point, a wall that you'll hit, where it is hopeless or um, nearly hopeless. And this problem is not going to go away. There are medical technologists trying to develop um, an artificial placenta turning um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation into a placenta into, and have the baby be in a vat of artificial antibiotic uh, fluid. Uh, now, who knows if it's going to be 20 years or 50 years before that um, is developed, but when it does, the first patient uh, who goes through that procedure is going to have a very uncomfortable time, and it's an ethical question that will have to be asked is, sure, we can do this, but should we? In deciding whether this is futile or not, um, and whether we should go forward, the doctors provided us with uh, statistics about uh, antenatal counseling. Um, I'm sorry, statistics at the antenatal counseling about outcomes for the child. The statistics were somewhat helpful to us, um, and they provided four categories in, in, with the outcomes. Um, unimpaired moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment, severe to profound neurodevelopmental impairment, and uh, death. And the way they provided the statistics to us were, were that 20% um, of children um, born at this stage would die before leaving the NICU, and of those survivors, 30% would emerge without um, impairment. So that um, made us. That was awfully oppressive, and it made us feel like uh, we had the uh, we were going to emerge with only six percent of a child. Um, so let's go advance here. Um, with those statistics, we um, you know a couple of years after um, we left the hospital. 
um, the, the fact that those statistics were presented to us and that they were the primary um, evidence given to us to, uh, to make our decision to go either in favor of resuscitation or against a resuscitation, it kind of nagged at us. And so we wrote to the Ethics Committee saying that we were, one of the things we were most concerned about is not uh, so much the ability of our child um, after uh, two years of age, which is what the statistics aimed at, um, but more the quality of life of the child. And so we were encouraging them to come up with some ways to show parents uh, what the quality of, the, of life their ch child will have after, um, um, or what ranges of quality of life there are after uh, the care is provided. So the meeting with that ethics committee uh, happened back in October, and they were very thoughtful and very um, engaged in, in the things that we had t uh, written to them. We found out that the uh, this land line in the sand for 23 weeks and zero days of gestation was gone at Swedish Medical Center, which made us very happy. Um, they said, well, we're, s we're sorry that you felt pushed to, uh, to give up, but uh, some families really are looking to let go at that stage, and you can't say things to those families to make them feel obligated to continue uh, trying to save a child. Um, I suggested the phrase, your child is welcome in our nursery, would be a good opening line for antenatal counseling, um, both because it does not introduce bias into the situation and because that was our primary stressor at that moment, is well, what if they won't take him? It's not like getting kicked out of a daycare. Um, you can't go to another uh, NICU that easily. Um, I'd also, uh, that phrase, I believe, also would provide personhood uh, to the child. Uh, Miri felt uh, like the uh, child was not being treated as a child in this conversation at the antenatal counseling. Rather, he was being talked about as a medical condition. Um, and she said, no, I'm the one with the medical condition. I have preterm labor. Uh, the baby is okay. They also said that the decision uh, of the family um, that after the antenatal counseling should be fully supported and that the, um, that decision had not been fully supported in our case, and they apologized for that, and boy, did that make me feel better. Um, and then I uh, suggested that in addition to the gloomy national statistics, they provide some local statistics to give a better, uh, closer idea, idea of what could happen um, with treatment. Um, and Dr. Beckstrom then said, well, Eric, we could say that uh, our NICU has a 100% success rate with 22-week preemies. And I had smacked my forehead and I said, okay, I see your point. And that uh, Gabriel's the only one who um, at that stage has been through that NICU. Um, the other thing we talked about was that a, we thought a birth to three medical professional, um, either a pediatric neurologist or a therapist who works with um, preemies uh, after they've left the NICU should attend the counseling to give parents an idea of what kind of um, life they have um, in their recovery and growth uh, periods. Also, last fall, the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics um, issued new uh, cardio or CPR uh, recommendations for preemies. I won't read the whole thing, but what it um, d says is that um, the lower limit is now 22 weeks of gestation, and this, the language in this statement here um, provides um, more, um, emphasizes more participation from the parents than the previous uh, statement had. Uh, I wrote a letter to them last spring encouraging them to be more willing to treat 22-week uh, preemies. And uh, I don't know if my letter had that in much influence in getting this new set of standards here, but I was quite happy when uh, they were published. Also, I'm working on an editorial to the Journal of uh, Pediatrics, um, which is about, um, I've written two drafts to them. At first I thought they'd just say, oh, you're just a, a parent. You don't, you know, you're not, a, you're not a medical professional. You don't know how to write with us. But they've been very... Um, uh, engaged and thoughtful, and they want to publish this, but what they're going to do is uh, ha pair me up with a neonatologist from Florida to write uh, this article about improving counseling and how doctors and parents can better understand each other. 
And so um, what I'm arguing in my half of the article is that ability statistics are okay, but also there needs to be information about quality of life, uh, testimonial from parents who have had uh, preemies um, and ha their perceptions of their child's uh, quality of life and their uh, perceptions of their own quality of life. Um, of course, quality is, by its very nature, is harder to put into a chart uh, than statistics about ability are. Um, but I, it needs to be done. It needs to be done some, somehow. I also th uh, recommended that they seek out the motivation of parents um, for the decisions that they're making, not to uh, grill them or to make them f you know, feel like, uh, you know, why is it you're doing this thing, not to challenge them, but to find out just why it is that, you know, what it is uh, that they care about. Uh, for example, uh, we were concerned primarily about uh, quality of life of our child. Um, if we had been told that, um, there was, you know, that he was almost certain to uh, be a, um, he would have a short life and suffer very, very much. Um, we would have thought about uh, not re resuscitating, but it, given how they presented the statistics and the information, we were we dug on our heels, and we were only going to dig in our heels. And so, if they want to get to informed consent, if they want to get to actual interaction between the parents and the uh, doctors, I, I. Th thought they should talk more about quality of uh, life. And then an additional uh, motivation um, that parents might have is expense. Not so much the expense of care, because in most states, uh, Medicaid will come in and uh, provide the... Uh, the, the um, uh, provide for the expense of the care in the NICU, but if you have parents who are concerned about how to leave uh, enough money in their wills uh, to provide for a developmentally uh, disabled adult, um, you know, several decades down the road, um, a financial counselor coming to talk, or a financial caseworker coming to talk to the parents would be valuable. Another question I was recommending they ask is, um, which is better, a short goodbye now or a strong possibility of another, um, of, a, of a goodbye in a week? We felt like we were being pushed to um, take the... Um, Take the shorter route. Um, the, the doctors seem to be, you know, so oh, it's much, it's much harder uh, later on. Um, we, on the other hand, um, given our religious beliefs, believe that uh, all life glorifies God, even if, uh, even a short life, even if it includes suffering. Um, and we would have felt um, worse about a child who was not given a chance uh, than we would a child who lived for a short time and died. And then the last uh, recommendation I made was to talk about the baby by name. Um, our, we had picked out a name um, for Gabriel at the time we were having antenatal counseling, uh, but we were still just talking about statistics, um, which I didn't really um, approve of. I thought we should have talked more about uh, you know, Gabriel uh, by, by name, and it would have uh, retrieved his, his personhood from this notion of, of the medical condition.